Bit of a beggar, but uh, there we go. I think you must have exceeded yourself. Uh, so tonight we welcome uh, Adrian Hughes. He is no stranger. He's been to speak to us before, all the way from Clandidno, and his subject is traces of World War II in North Wales. I need have said that, need I? I could have said, look at the screen. Adrian, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to start with an apology. Never a good way to start a talk, I have to say. But um, as it was alluded to, uh, I was due to be here May 2020, and in fact, uh, I haven't given a talk since at least March 2020. So um, some of this might be a little rusty, so I'm going to refer to my notes a little bit. So. Sorry? I don't know. Can someone turn the music off? The music and the speakers? years after the end of the war and they're asking volunteers to photograph and map the traces of the Second World War in the old county of Carnarvonshire and Anglesey and so I volunteered and I went round and I, I photographed some of these things and these is what I was going to share with you tonight. Um, a very famous cartoon. In May 1940 much of Western Europe was under the uh, Nazi jackboot and Britain stood alone as this famous David Lowe cartoon first published in the Evening Standard sums up. British troops had just been pushed back to the French coast and evacuated at Dunkirk, some 338,000 of them. And so as Neville Chamberlain resigned and Churchill became Prime Minister there was also a change at the top of Britain's home defence and a chap called General Ironside was put in charge and he was responsible for all the anti-invasion uh, defences and for commanding troops in the event of German landings. Now, he decided to defend the country by using a series of stop lines, and these were defensive lines that made use of natural obstacles, such as um, lakes and mountains, um, and he coupled these with pillboxes, anti-tank barriers, trenches, barbed wire entanglements, minefields, you name it, he thought of it and put them in the way of the advancing enemy. So the actual direction of enemy attack was of course unknown, and while the shortest, most obvious route would have been straight across the English Channel, um, the authorities had to prepare for every eventuality. And one possible direction of attack was actually from the west, it was from Ireland, neutral Ireland. And in fact, Hitler and his generals thought of this twice of a way forward for attacking uh, Britain, and they codenamed it Operation Dream. So this is a, a map of Northwest Wales, as uh, you can obviously see, and the blue lines on it are the stop lines that were put in by General Ironside in 1940. Um, so we have. Stop line 23, which starts at uh, Port Maddock, Black Rock Sands. It winds its way up um, through um, sort of Clamberis and Ogwen Valley and then ends up by Penguin Castle at Bangor. 
Stop line 22 is this short one that pretty much follows the line of the River Conway. And then 22, stop line 21, sorry, stop line 21, starts around uh, Barmouth and on the other side at Fairbourne, and then is a huge arc that finishes at Colwyn Bay. So they're the three stop lines that were put in in North Wales. And then, of course, there were plenty more across the whole of the United Kingdom. So at the start of stop line 21, down at Fairbourne, you see these huge blocks of concrete. Um, and these rather impressive monoliths stand around six foot tall, and these are anti-tank blocks. And they were built in 1940. There's another view of them. Um, and the Fairbourne defences ran for some one and a half miles along the beach there and along the mouth of Kestery. And they consist of over 650 of these concrete blocks. They're sometimes known as dragon's teeth, whether that's just in Wales, I'm not sure, but they, they are anyway. Um, each anti-tank cube is uh, trapezoid in shape. It's just under six foot tall and weighs in about eight tonnes each. Um, they were fabricated on site by local uh, contractors under the watchful eye of the Royal Engineers. So these weren't uh, sort of ad hoc as such, but um, of, a, uh, of a similar de design across the country. And set amongst the uh, anti-tank blocks were pillboxes, and you can see we've got one there. And there were five of these pillboxes just on this one straight, uh, one stretch of beach alone. Um, and although most of them have gone now, this one does remain. Um, and then on the beach itself, uh, there would have been barbed wire entanglements, um, trenches, mines, and all sorts of other um, apparatus to stop any sort of advance. <coughs> That's a close-up of the pillbox, and these were built to a nationally similar design and known as a Type 24, if you're an anorak amongst the pillboxes, um, and it's an irregular hexagonal shape. And they were manned by the Marionettes' home guard, and each could accommodate up to eight men armed with rifles and light machine guns and anti-tank weapons. And can you imagine being in there and had the Germans arrived on the beach at Fairbourne, and that's all you had, a couple of rifles, Gren gun and the whole might of the German army landing on the beach, so it certainly wouldn't have been a, a good place to be. So after 80 years, unfortunately some of the uh, dragon's teeth are start, starting to subside, <coughs> the, uh, the salt water's rotting, the mortar and the concrete. And of course, I think if you've uh, been watching the news, you'll be aware that Fairbourne residents were recently told by Gwynedd County Council that uh, they would only continue to maintain the seawall that you can see there for a further 40 years. And after that, with rising sea levels, Fairbourne is on its own, really. And um, so the fate of those uh, uh, dragon's teeth and the village itself is very much in the balance. But what's amusing, I suppose, or ironic, I should say, is that um, Cadu, a couple of years ago, decided to do some uh, remedial work on the dragon's teeth to try and strengthen them. They don't do anything with the seawall to protect the village, but they did some work that. So who knows, that's uh, government bodies for you. So over at Black Rock Sands, we can find, which is just near Port Maddock, we can find even more anti-tank blocks. Uh, and this is part of stop line 21, so, so the first one I showed you there. And while many are buried beneath the shifting sands, some make rather interesting features amongst the posh caravans. You can see at the back there, some have uh, hung out their washing. I'm sure there's a song about hanging out washing on, on lines, isn't it? Or is that the sea creep line? Um, and Black Rock Sands, similar to Fairbourne, would have been covered in uh, barbed wire entanglements. Also, these anti-glider poles were sunk into the beach, so had the Germans decided to land gliders with troops on, then it would have made it much more difficult for them. And once you start seeing lumps of stone and concrete in uh, North Wales countryside, you can't stop seeing it. And this is another line, um, and this is near Hrith Deep, um, and they stretch across the Nantal Valley. And then there's some more. I found those on the A470 at Clampastinio. It's interesting that they're just made out of thin slate. The others have been made out of uh, pebbles off the beach. So basically, any material that was close to hand was used. <coughs> and then hidden in the trees on the A470, just outside uh, Betterford Coid, uh, I found a few more. This on the side of the Avon Pledet. 
and uh, a full buffer of roadblock to restrict access past Pont Jeffin. And there we are. It's not my jag as we speed past, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, just another angle of it. And even up in um, the Sutton Pass, just above Conway, this is where this photo was taken, looking down towards Capilalo and Dugavolki. Uh, there's a few more bits of evidence of anti-tank devices. This is here. It's an anti-tank wall. So just in case, that, that's the road, that's the Sutton Pass road. So just in case the Germans decided to come up this really narrow path, the uh, General Ironside put a little wall there, and he also put um, some anti-tank blocks on the road itself, and there's my little dog for scale. <laughs> okay. he, uh, he's very much a poser. Since the camera comes out, he's not there. And as well as anti-tank blocks, there was another type of anti-tank barricade that was widely used across the region, and these were reinforced steel hairpins. And they could be put in at fairly uh, short notice. They went into sockets uh, on the road, and this photo was taken at uh, Port Penman, uh, so at the end of stop line number 23. Um, and so if the Germans had managed to land and get off the beaches, then they would have quickly driven their forces inland and to reach the industrial part of Britain, the northwest of England, and the Midlands. And General Ironside recognised this, and he set up two major defensive positions right in the heart of Snowdonia at a couple of key road junctions known as nodal points. One was at the head of the Mount Franklin Pass near Clinogwen, and the second at the road junctions close to the Pennegruid Hotel, just above Clanberris. And this is the view down the Mount Frankon from Ogwen Cottage towards Bethesda, where you recognise the A5 there. And you can just make out, right at the bottom there, there's a little pillbox. Incredibly well camouflaged. And so right at the head of the valley, if you take the old road past the little youth hostel, you can find more anti-tank blocks, that's what those are there. Um, <coughs> and they even appeared in an early episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> Above the um, anti-tank blocks, stone sniper posts were put in, and uh, they're still there today, although they were rebuilt by the National Trust, so they didn't have to always look like that. And as you can imagine, very good place to lob a few grenades if the Germans decided to to uh, speed up the A5. So um, that's a slightly better view of that little pillbox that I showed you a second ago. And then there's a second pillbox right on the side of Clin Ogre, that's obviously Trivan in the background, the A5 there where everyone parks, and the police put lots of bollards to stop people parking and then tow them away, but on the opposite side we have uh, another pillbox. And this is what it looks like inside. Um, we've obviously got the embrasures and um, the door. And the National Trust have actually cleared this one relatively recently um, and put a gate on it so you can actually get inside this one now. Uh, it's not just the sheet, which usually they smell horrific. These bits of concrete on the floor, you can see they're shaped. Well, they actually used to go in to the um, uh, loopholes into the embrasures, so obviously that would stop the, uh, the wind howling through them. But could you imagine being stuck in one of these in the winter? Absolutely faulty. And then, and then finally at Clinog, when we find these uh, strange cylindrical structures. Make out one there with uh, an old one in the background and another one there. And these um, were to mount an anti tank weapon known as a spigot mortar. Um, and they're usually set in a hollow. Sorry, I've not gone wrong here. Uh, they're usually set in a hollow, as you can see just in the foreground there. And then this uh, steel, stainless steel pin at the top is where the weapon mounted. Uh, there's a couple more of these further down the old track past the farmhouse. And that's what a spigot mortar looked like. So you can see the, uh, the soldiers in, um, in the hollow. Um, 
It was sometimes known as a Blacker Bombard, Bombard even, after its inventor, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Blacker, and it fired a 29mm mortar horizontally as an anti-tank weapon. So it was pretty primitive as, uh, as weapons go, especially when you consider that its accuracy was only really effective between 75 and 100 yards, so there was absolutely no time to reload this thing before the enemy was on you. So as I say, if you miss, you haven't got much chance. And still littered all over um, the area, you find uh, three-inch mortars. And these were found just behind the pillbox, uh, just before lockdown, by Michael Morgan Owen. Um, and uh, yeah, so they're smoke mortars. So they're in the museum now, actually. Um, these might not actually anything to do with the home guard in their defensive positions, but as you probably know, much of the Con Ebi was used by the army for training uh, between 40 and 45. So it, it could easily be uh, the regular army as they were training rather than the home guard when they were at their uh, anti-German defences. So the other main concentration of defences is around Pedigurid, at uh, that noble point, that junction there. That's the famous Penagurid Hotel, uh, made famous when the, uh, for the Everest expedition stayed there in the 1950s. And it's interesting that the number of defensive positions around that hotel, because in 1939, the uh, Lake House School from Beck Hill, uh, down in Sussex, was evacuated there. And as soon as these um, uh, military defensive positions started to be put in, they had to be moved out, obviously, because clearly it wasn't a particular safe to be. This is uh, Flynn Lockwood in the background there looking towards Kapilkerig and there just in the foreground you can see yet another pillbox uh, covered in earth, very difficult to spot from the air. That's a view through the loophole. So that was your field of view, not very much, cold, dark. Another pillbox there with the stone horseshoe in the background, and this one looks down towards Clint Gwynant and Beth Gellert. Um, and then another one, this one's above the uh, Clamberis Pass, you can just make out the road in the background there. Uh, the metal work on the side is probably so that uh, camouflage nets could be uh, thrown over the top of it, over the entire structure. And again, it's, uh, it's earth covered. This is quite a nice one inside. Uh, the bunk beds are still in. So, um, probably not easy to sleep on now with the springs the way they are, but um, even so, it's, um, it's quite nice to be 80 years old it's, uh, to find them still in it. And to be honest, it's one of the tidiest hill boxes I've ever been into because they usually look like that. And that one's in uh, Hollyhead at Hollyhead Harbour. So you crawl into them and then you, well, you, heaven only knows what you're about to find or crawl onto. So uh, not particularly pleasant. So while we're on Anglesey, let's just hop across and uh, to RF Bedorgan, that well-known uh, airfield that you've probably never heard of. Um, now, on Anglesey, the oldest uh, RAF base is Mona, or RAF Clangevny, as it was called originally. Um, it's a First World War Royal Navy uh, airship station. And um, then, of course, you've all heard of RAF Valley. That started life as a fighter station uh, before having new, longer runways built and used as a transit base for uh, primarily American uh, bombers to come over. Um, and as I say, RAF Bedorgan, probably not ever heard of. It was a small maintenance unit and it was built in 1940 and it actually has some of the best preserved World War, fe uh, World War II features on the island. So the Bodorgan estate was uh, requisitioned by the Air Ministry from Sir George Maybrick and it's still a private estate today which is probably why the pillboxes are in such good condition. Although it does make access a little tricky because it's of course on private land. So you can make out the one at the back there. And this is uh, the Trevi pillbox. It's part of the airfield defences to build, uh, defend the airfield from around the minor roads leading from Aberfrau, which is actually now part of the North Wales uh, coastal path. It consists of a hexagonal pillbox 
with a gun pit at the back um, and a narrow stone corridor between the two. And the airfield was here in the background. That gives a better view of it. You can see the gun pit and the actual uh, embrasures itself. And obviously, looking out to see the beautiful spot, I have to say. Um, it was positioned on slightly higher ground, so it gave a good all-round view to the sea and, of course, any incoming approaching enemy aircraft. And then at uh, what is now the farm, these were actually Royal Air Force uh, buildings, part of the ma maintenance unit, um, and the workshops, um, and again, you can just make in the background some of the uh, grass landing uh, fields and runways. And this photo shows some of the old barrack blocks, the offices, and of course the ever important ablution block. Um, in the distance, you can just make out Aberfrau. Um, and as an aside, RAF Bedorgan was initially called RAF Aberfrau, but some Mandarins in London struggled to say Aberfrau, <laughs> so they changed the name to Bedorgan. But this uh, had history on Anglesey because originally RAF Valley was called RAF Osnigan, but again, the Mandarins in London struggled with Osnigan. <laughs> Valley was much easier for them, so there was uh, a few name changes as uh, time went on. And then as you're sort of leaving um, the Bedorgan estate, if you uh, follow the wall, you can find lots of little holes in it, loopholes, in bridges, um, and engineers have added over 50 of these down this wall um, just to be used um, for, for rifles or light machine guns. And this actually is my favourite pillbox in the whole of uh, North Wales. It's spectacular, but it's still there about 80 years. Um, and it has commanding views of the Kevney estuary that you can just make out in the background. It's in three sections, the gun pit, uh, which is there, where the gun was mounted, you've got the crew room, and then you've got um, the pillbox itself, that familiar hexagonal shape, and the bit on the top was for an anti-aircraft gun. Um, there's a there was. Close up of the uh, gun pit, and uh, this is where a light anti aircraft gun like a Lewis or a Vickers K would have been mounted. And it's facing away from the estuary, so it obviously was there to protect the runways. And inside the old crew room, you can just make out above the fireplace the date 1940. You can see it's obviously got a reinforced concrete roof. So, going back over the uh, Menai Straits towards uh, south of Carnarvon and RF Clandurog. And this was completed in 1941 as a fighter base in order to protect uh, those from Ireland. However, by the time it was finished, the uh, threat of invasion had pretty much passed. And so um, it was used mainly as an air gunnery school to train air gunners. And parts of Clandurua today um, are now Carnarvon Airport, and it's also home to the new Coast Guard helicopter since it was privatised in 2015, and those big yellow birds of the RAF that we used to see so familiarly across North Wales were decommissioned. So this is uh, on Dinas Dinkle, so where the uh, Iron Age Hill Fort is at the bottom. You have a Second World War, what's called a seagull trench, just from the shape of it. It's got the, the, the shape of a seagull's wings, um, and that overlooks both the beach and the airfield. And that's the view from it, looking down the beach of Dinas Dinsville. Um, now, much of the land uh, over here is now owned by the RSPB and it's managed for wildlife, especially uh, breeding wading birds. But during the war, the beach itself was mined, and signs in both English and Welsh warned danger, death, heavily mined. And many of the um, former RF buildings are still evident, and these uh, former stores have been re-roofed and are now used by the local farmer. And then this is the view back across Clandura towards Snowdonia. But I want to draw your attention to this steel, rusty, cupola nestled in the hedgerow and this is actually called an Alan Williams turret and it was named after a Chester based engineer 
who designed and fabricated them. Originally, it was mounted on wheels and a track that would allow it to rotate through 360 degrees. And there were two firing positions, one at the front and one out the top. And in total, there are only ever 200 of these made. And so today, there's only known to be 33 left. And this one at Klandurov is holding up the farmer's fence. So it really <laughs> can do with the, being moved and put in the, really put in the air museum at, um, at Canal. And this is what it was like. Very cosy, I think, is uh, how we uh, could describe it. I hope they were good friends. I uh, hope they had another curry the night before. It was pretty horrific in there. And of course, freezing cold in the winter and boiling hot in the summer. So um, I'm sure when Alan Williams uh, designed this in his Chester workshop, he thought it was a good idea. But practically, maybe that is why they only made 200 of them in the end. Um, you know, it wasn't. Uh, perfect at all. And there it is, a close up, like everything else, full of rubbish, and as you can see, it's holding up the, uh, the farmer's fence. And there's no evidence that this is in its original position. As I say, you, you know what farmers are like, for sort of uh, making use of things, so I'm sure he thought, oh, 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 good for holding it, uh, holding my fence up. And just on the outskirts of Klandurov village itself, some of the uh, former Aria uh, buildings have been put to good use, including this one here that's been turned into a little antique shop. Um, the static caravan park just along the way has made use of one of the towers. And nestled behind the industrial estate at Klandurov is this Stanton shelter. So this is a, a, a prefabricated air raid shelter, um, which were assembled on the site. I think, yeah, that's what it looked like inside. Um, they provided air raid protection around the airfield, and they'd have originally been brick, built, uh, been brick built benches inside them. And then you can see the steel ladder at the end. Um, and so, if there'd been a direct uh, hit at the entrance, the idea was that there was a little escape hatch there, and you could uh, get your way out. And so flying stopped at RF Klandurov in June 1945, but that wasn't the end of the story for uh, this particular area, because in 1946, chemical weapons which had been captured from the Germans were brought to Klandurov and stored on the former runways. And in total, 71,000 bombs containing lethal nerve agents were on site until the mid-1950s. And the bombs were then loaded onto landing craft before uh, being loaded onto bigger ships moored in the bay and transported to Scotland. And this was known as Operation Sandcastle. And these structures here at the back of Kandurov uh, date from that time. And a friend of mine, uh, and I think he's spoken to you, John Lawson Ray, um, at one point, um, he did his national service with the Royal Air Force at Klandura, and he was telling me that he spent every single day for week after week after week chopping off the tail fins of these uh, lethal uh, bombs because you could obviously pack more onto the ship without the tail fin, and probably the tail fin made of metal, um, metal shortages post-war were used for something else. So they set up a sort of guillotine thing, and they would put in, load in one of these nerve agents, bang off the tail thing, next one, next one, and they did it for weeks after weeks after weeks, so there we go. Now talking of bombs and chemical weapons, before uh, going to Klandurov, many were stored at Glyn Cromwell. So we've got a map there, Clamberis, Clamberis Lake, and just at the back there, Glyn Cromwell. And there it is. Um, now this, as I say, is um, on the shores of Clinpadden, Clamberis, and if developers get their way, then this will be the site of a new hydroelectric plant, and what remains of the former RAF bomb store will be lost forever. And so in 1941, the Air Ministry took possession of the old Glyn Connery Quarry to store weapons and munitions, and a series of galleries were built the size of two football pitches and completely, completely covered in slate, so to camouflage it. So you can see there, if you can imagine this was an open cast quarry, they built these galleries in and then covered it with, um, with slate waste. But actually, the galleries continued all the way to the end, or to the front here. But um, 
unfortunately, in 1942, after heavy snowfall, the front part of the building completely collapsed um, under the weight of snow and the slate above and buried 14,000 tons of explosives. And so, um, the poor guys in the RAF had to dig them out because obviously the uh, ordnance was needed. Um, and yeah, so it was an incredible job that they had to do. This is a, a tunnel, there was a little railway that uh, led to, uh, to the um, Connery uh, site and that train in turn, that railway in turn linked up with the national network. So basically what would happen is that the RAF airfields around the country or in, indeed around the world would contact Lynn Connery, um, ask for whatever munitions they wanted, they were loaded onto these trains and then transported to where they were needed. Uh, in the UK by rail, but then of course a lot would go to the port of Liverpool and be shipped overseas. And I have to say, it's one of the darkest places I've ever been into, and it doesn't seem to matter what size torch, you can take a million candlelight torch with you, it makes no difference, it's absolutely pitch black. So the photos inside um, aren't the best, because you, the camera just won't focus, but um, here we are, there's a few. I'll show you. That's the old lift. So as I say, it was arranged over a couple of floors. This was obviously to, to uh, move the munitions between the floors. And then we have some very interesting graffiti. Uh, usually the door is locked to this, and it's got a huge steel uh, reinforced door, massive padlock. But just very occasionally I've been down, and it's been unlocked. And uh, obviously the local graffiti artists too have found it uh, unlocked. I can't show you a lot of it because it's before the watershed. <laughs> so I'm trying to give you some sort of idea of what it's like inside. I mean, it would make an absolutely brilliant museum. It's uh, yeah, a bit like the Green uh, Cavern Military Museum was in uh, Hollywell a few years ago. Um, it would be absolutely superb. As I say, developers have got ideas for uh, a hydroelectric site. There we are. There's another one inside. And this is a, an original Air Ministry notice that's stenciled on the wall, and it's a bit faint to read, so I, I shall read it to you. It says, the filthy habit of spitting must be discontinued. Anyone found spitting will be severely dealt with. Chewing of tobacco is prohibited. Offenders are liable to be dismissed. <laughs> so, uh, nice bit of uh, rules and regulations from 80 years ago. And staying with the RAF for a second, uh, the Air Ministry uh, and the Air Ministry, uh, if we go to the Conway Valley, and Dolgarrog Aluminium Works was opened in 1908. And during the Second World War, it came under the jurisdiction of the Air Ministry, as aluminium, of course, was so important in the production of aircraft. And therefore, it was vital to protect both the Dolgarrog Aluminium Works and the nearby power station. So around Dolgarrog, anti-aircraft guns, pillboxes were built, all of which sadly are gone today. Um, however, in the hills above uh, Dolgarrog, so that's where the aluminium works was, and we're going to go up here into the AGI Valley where they built a decoy site. And that's all that's left of it today. You've got uh, some of the uh, outer walls. Um, and these are the blast walls of the control um, bunker, and they, the, the decoys themselves were positioned in a field on the opposite side of the road. Um, and the decoys were a system of fires that were lit in graziers, and uh, the idea, of course, was that if the German bombers had been going over, once the air raid siren had been sounded, the RAF guys would run out and light these graziers, hoping that the Germans would bomb these instead of the dog, uh, aluminium works down in the bottom of the valley. And to give you an idea of what the bunker might have looked like, there's another one that's uh, near Kilcane. Um, there were a lot more um, decoy sites in northeast Wales, protecting uh, places, uh, industrial places around Shotton, Flint, Brecton, etc. So uh, you can make out there's a sort of Anderson shelter type uh, structure behind the blast walls. Now the only other uh, 
RF decoy site built in northwest Wales was actually on Anglesey within the sand dunes at Newgrove, and today it's been heavily forested. And the idea behind this was to have an exact replica of uh, RAF Valley's runways in the sand dunes, complete with lights, and hope that if the Germans had bombed the uh, sand dunes rather than the uh, valley itself. And so from a small control bunker, a generator would have powered those. As you can see, my dog's got in on this one as well. <laughs> And so this is the entrance to the original control bunker. Um, in 1992, the Forestry Commission converted it into a, a bat hibern maculum. I think that's the word. Somewhere where bats live. And by poking the camera inside, that's all you can pretty much see today, which is just uh, not very much, true to say. Unfortunately, tragedy struck in October 1942 when an Australian pilot called Graham Wood tried to land his Bristol Bowfighter at Newbra rather than Valley because he missed up the lights of the uh, decoy site for Valley itself and he killed himself and the navigator Ronald Scott and they're buried at Mice Coverage Cemetery in, um, in Hollyhead. Staying on Anglesey for a second, uh, many of you will have driven past the former Saunders Road factory that moved to Friars Bay near Bomaris in 1940 from the Isle of Wight. Um, and these are just some of the uh, images uh, from the place as it is today. Uh, in 1941, the Air Ministry awarded Saunders Road a contract to modify American and Canadian seaplanes for use by the Royal Air Force. Flying boats were used by the Royal Air Force for long range reconnaissance duties to escort convoys of merchant navy ships and, if sighted, to bomb enemy submarines. And so at this site, the seaplanes were fitted with large, uh, long-range fuel tanks and fitted with bomb racks ready for their service in coastal command. And in total, over 300 were converted at Beaumaris in these very hangars. So, lots of view inside. And of course, post-war, these uh, hangars, uh, Saunders Road, uh, continued to use them. They built buses and they built um, uh, an aluminium hold MTB and all sorts of things. So uh, they, they continue to be used quite a long time after the war. This is the view looking over towards Penmine Mare. And to be honest, I'm surprised that the site's never really been developed, especially for housing. Um, although I think that now might be uh, a plan because frankly, the views are amazing. And uh, I'm sure they would uh, change hands for a pretty penny. And then this is the uh, ramp that leads from the sheds down to the Menai Straits. And this is probably, again, post-war. Um, as I say, Saunders Road did try and develop other aluminium-based products after World War II, very light and fast MTBs. But the problem was that the whole bent um, caved in, in in very rough water and at speed. Um, and in fact, the prototype uh, today lies on the seabed off Point Linus, so it wasn't overly successful. So I'm sure many of you have driven into Clandidno from the Deganway end, driven down uh, past Mysdy Golf Club. I wonder if any of you have noticed the holes in the wall as you go down. So these are, um, again, the, the very end of stop line number 22. So um, these were, were put in uh, as loopholes, and you can see the, uh, the staggered bricks, so that uh, you've got a wider field of view. I bet you next time you drive down the road, you'll have a look at them. <laughs> so in 1941, the military requisitioned this tiny little bit of land um, of Mysdy Golf Course for a defence post, and they put the loopholes in the wall. And they were probably manned by the local uh, battalion of the Home Guard, 5th Carnarvonshire, as it was in Clandon. Um, and today, Mysdy Golf Club use those buildings to store their tractors and other associated equipment. And just staying in kind of there for a second, so another strange, I suppose, trace of the Second World War is, um, is shown here. So on the left-hand picture, it's the same building, one black and white, one colour. You can see these beautiful ornate railings, and in the modern picture, they've gone, although the top one is, uh, is still in place. 
Um, there we go. And yeah, the reason I put it in is to illustrate the point of wartime salvage collecting. So you can make just out on the on the top of the wall where the original um, uh, railings were. Um, so it was in 1943 that the Ministry of Works ordered all councils to survey iron railings in their area and the Borough Engineer and Surveyor of Clandon and Urban District Council listed every address and the length and height of all railings, gates and gate posts and householders were then notified that the railings would be taken and a Liverpool firm came down and carried out the work. And most of the railings of course were never used for uh, turning into tanks and after the war um, you just found huge piles of scrap metal everywhere. Pretty much the same with the saucepans of a Spitfire's campaign that uh, Lord Beaverbrock brought in in 1940, sort of galvanised the housewives of the nation to, to donate their pots and pans, and post-war those pots and pans were never used, and they just lay in big, big piles. And in fact, uh, there's a, there's a, there was a bell produced, a little aluminium bell, and uh, it says on the side uh, to benefit the RAF Benevolent Fund and that it's, this bell is made from downed enemy aircraft. But of course, there were hundreds of thousands of these bells made and not that many German aircraft were actually shot down in the grand scheme of things. And it is said that the pots and pans that the British housewives donated to the saucepans campaign went into those bells. So you're ringing the bell thinking it's a bit of a Heinkel or a bit of a Dornier. It's not. It's Anne Doris's tea <laughs> <laughs> you know. So just staying in Clandon there a second. There we are. On the side of the Great Orm, we have the School of Coastal Artillery. There we are. That's looking down from the Marine Drive. I think this is what you were saying before. So as you look down, this is pretty much what you can see. You've got all these uh, concrete bases and uh, not much else. But when you actually go down to ground level, um, you start to be able to see a few more bits. So this, is, uh, this was the munition store. There were 14 of them. And these were large, um, if you like, large Anderson shelters, large corrugated shelters. And you can see the wooden posts that were put in to support the roof because um, photos there, yeah, there it is, the bulldozers piling earth on top of them, so it had to be reinforced. So um, that photo was taken in 1940. The School of Coastal Artillery opened in uh, September 1940. They were evacuated from Shugreness in Essex uh, to Clandidno, and um, they were there for five years. And the reason they came to Clandidno was that basically they were in danger where they were in Shugreness. They needed to expand they needed uh, more men, they needed to do more training, which they couldn't do on the Thames estuary. And also, uh, the German bombers were uh, coming over quite frequently, bombing them, so they couldn't do night firing. So uh, the commandant of the school searched the west coast of the UK for a suitable spot, and he chose Clissalley Drive on the Great Orm in London. And it was an ideal site because, uh, certainly at that time, the millionaires weren't all living there, so uh, there was no one to disturb. And um, it was a relatively flat level site um, with a relatively sheltered bay. So it was easy um, to get uh, targets, um, to, to mooch around, speed around the bay that the uh, gunners could fire at. Um, this one is um, the generator room or Angie Special Place, as it's known in Clandon, because that bit of graffiti has been there for many a year. And inside this room, um, there's huge plinths uh, where the three generators sat, um, and they powered the searchlights, and that is one of the uh, battery of searchlight emplacements. And that's what they looked like when they were built in 1940. And as I say, that's what they look like today, so they're not in bad condition to be honest with you. And you can see how flat and calm it is out in the bay looking over towards uh, Penmagna. And in the background there at the top you can see one of the uh, Atlanti aircraft guns that the gunners had. And they would um, fire at um, what they call Queen Bees, which is a remote control Tiger Moth. 
it used to take off from T. Croix on Anglesey, um, and it would be towing a target behind it. And, uh, so they would fire at that. Um, a few of those Queen Bees unfortunately crashed in Snowdonia. Um, but the problem was, of course, that people saw a plane crash and they would alert mountain rescue and alert the police. And of course, they'd go up there and spend hours looking for uh, the airmen to find, of course, that it was a remote control plane. And then this is the second uh, battery of um, searchlight emplacements. And then this photo is of some of the officers and the men who were uh, on one of the training courses in the grounds of the uh, now demolished Gogarth Abbey Hotel. Gogarth Abbey Hotel being the Alice in Wonderland where uh, Stephen Liddell uh, lived. Um, and you can see the steps going up to uh, Invalid's Wharf behind. You can tell the, uh, the, they're cadets because they've got these white uh, stripes on their forage caps. And obviously you've got the instructor in white at the front. So this is a familiar view if you go down towards St. Titno's Church on the Great Hall. Um, and in this area over here, there are some still some remnants of um, an old radar facility. And there's a bit of a close up view. That's all you can see today. Is these bits of concrete with uh, some iron work in. But this uh, old postcard taken um, looking, overlooking the cemetery, and you can see the little radar station at the top. I've zoomed in a bit there to give you a slightly better idea, but it's very pixelated. But you can see the, uh, the radar, the antenna on the roof. I'm sure many of you, if you've been on the Orm, have driven up the, uh, from the Rest and Be Thankful. Up there's a concrete track called, uh, locally known as the Tank Tracks, because these corrugations as you drive up it are all vibrating. Um, and during the war, it was the site of a top secret radar installation that came up from Dorset. Um, there's a couple more pictures of what it looks like today. And its official title was the Air Defence Research Development Establishment, or ADRDE. And this was a separate entity to the School of Coast Artillery that we've just spoken about lower down on uh, Pisgelly Drive. And to locals, it was actually known as Hatter's Castle, because uh, after the science fiction book by A.J. Cronin, and around uh, 1942, when they moved up from Dorset to Clandon, uh, Hatter's Castle was released at the cinema, and it was uh, about this mysterious building that uh, was sort of on the top of a hill. So locals in Clandon have been cultured, obviously saw similarities between the two. Um, and it must have been quite a sight. It was a 50 roomed building. It had a saucer shaped scanner on the roof, plus more generator rooms, garages, and a lookout tower. And this is a very low uh, resolution image. And you can, this is Hatter's Castle, this is ADRDE, though it's on the side of the orb. The top there, that is the uh, summit complex as we know it today, and that was taken over by the Royal Air Force in 1939 as a chain home low radar station. So, and then these in the foreground are uh, observation posts that belong to the uh, School of Coast Artillery, so that uh, the officers could watch how badly the cadets were firing at targets out at sea on the telephone and tell them they've missed and to have another go. So huge amount of uh, activity on the Great Hall during the Second World War. <coughs> Just very quickly, these are it's uh, Conway Morpher. Uh, you can see the larger and Degamware at the background and it's these sort of uh, circular concrete structures I just wanted to mention. Um, they're believed to be uh, little mobile anti-tank blocks that were used during the war. Um, so obviously you couldn't have massive anti-tank blocks entirely across the road because people couldn't go about their daily business. So they had to have mobile bits and pieces and that's what these uh, concrete cylinders are thought to be. And then post-war they've probably been repurposed um, to be used uh, for, against coastal erosion. 
are clearly not words here at Conway very well. And there's a closer view of them. So you'll see these quite a lot around the North West Coast. There's some more down towards uh, Aberdeen Greggin. There's, uh, there's loads over at Carnarvon as well, and there's some down at Dingling Colwyn Bay. So whether they, these were the actual ones that were used during the war, or whether they just used similar moulds post-war uh, for coastal erosion, we don't really know. And I just want to finish with this one here, actually, because this is uh, above the Crimea Pass, um, above Blind Pastinioc. So if you have literally hundreds of thousands of heel irons and hobnails and buckles, and they lie amongst the rough, tussocky grass on the windswept and snowy Crimea Pass. But how did they get there? Well, down the Blino itself, the market hall was used to repair military boots during the Second World War. And the story goes that at the end of the war, they had thousands of these unserviceable boots left. So they piled them into the back of a truck, drove to the top of the Crimea Pass, and just dumped them, and then set fire to them. And so that all that's left is the metal parts. And it's, uh, it's known as Boot Hill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's just a fascinating place, really. You just got no vegetation grows just on this one bit, probably because of the heat of the fire and, uh, and any chemicals. And then, as I say, you've got literally hundreds of thousands of these bits of metal, which is uh, absolutely fascinating. So there we are. Thank you. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> Told you it'd be a surprise, wasn't it? Oh, there we go, sunset. So, thank you very much for bearing with me as I run through beautiful North Wales to look at uh, traces of the Second World War. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. That was uh, that was particularly interesting. I'm sure that uh, when we uh, when, when we go out and about in the future, and we see lots of concrete, we should look at them in a different light. Absolutely, please do. Yeah. Uh, you can see that all of these places that uh, that we've seen tonight were built for comfort, without a doubt. Uh, I notice that uh, that Banksy is uh, evident, even uh, even back where those things were constructed. So again, thank you very much. If there are any questions that anybody has for Adrian. I'm yes, sorry, be prepared to answer them. Michael? Yes, going back to the Cape Man and through Greece, Rome, right through, man has always left his mark, graffiti of one kind or another. The only pictures we saw, 68, 69, and 90, had almost modern graffiti. When you see native pillboxes, have you seen men put Joe Blogs? 1942. Sadly not, because see any. no. The main thing is, I think, is that they were often rendered on the inside to start with, back in the 1940s. But over the years, that has fallen off. So any graffiti would probably be a, have been on that surface, and obviously that has now fallen off. And so what's left is graffiti on the on the brickwork, and is is post war. But I'm sure you know that there would have been plenty, because there would have been you know their uncomfortable places to be. Let's be honest. Um, and you know, as you say, as you pointed out, people uh, uh, millennia have written their dissatisfaction about their superior officers on walls, and I'm sure those pillboxes would have been no different. Okay, thank you. Hi there. What was the most interesting part uh, of, of, of the areas for you to describe personally? What was there some areas that you weren't really aware of, and so they came as a surprise to you to actually discover? Well, to be honest, the, the, yeah, absolutely. The, the amount of structures that are still left, I think, probably came as the biggest surprise. And, and I think we're still discovering, you know, especially anti-tank blocks. You go down some ridiculously steep hill in some what is now quite enough forested area been around Bessus Lacoid and things and you just find big lumps of concrete and, and they look out of place in the countryside and pretty much they are of course anti-tank blocks but you know they, they haven't very well been recorded over the years. Um, it is now something that uh, Gwyneth Archaeological Trust and, and their ilk are now doing um, because it's you know it's now 80 years but back in the day which didn't record it, it was just a wartime thing and, and they moved on. So I think, yeah, absolutely, I think that the, the surprise was the amount and that's just North West Wales. Mm. I mean, if you start going to North East Wales and, you know, the, 
there's so much more. So it's everywhere, really. You just sort of have to get your eye in and see it. No, pleasure. The, uh, the pots and pans and the railings that they, that they took up, why didn't they recycle? Why didn't they just uh, They just weren't high enough quality. That's the top and bottom of it. They just weren't good enough. So, um, but going, I mean, the pots and pans one especially, and if you excuse the pun, really galvanised the, uh, the housewives of Britain to feel that they were doing their bit for the war effort. So in that respect, it was, it was a masterstroke by Beaverbrook. I'm sure it wasn't the idea, but uh, they just really weren't of, of, of decent enough quality. Um, so that's really why they weren't used. So, um, yeah. Yeah, plenty. Mm. Okay, so Clandano itself had three bombs dropped. Three. 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 Yeah, three. Yeah, 31st of May 1941. And, and the chances are, with, with a lot of these, they were going for Liverpool, they were going for Manchester, they were going for the northwest of England. The bombers used to take off from airfields in uh, Brittany. Uh, and they would follow the Irish coast because Ireland was neutral, it wasn't blacked out. They would get as far as Dublin, you turn right, you follow the Welsh coast in, and it takes you straight into Liverpool. And so the bombs that certainly dropped on Liverpool, uh, dropped on Clandano in May 1941, was really at the height that Liverpool was being uh, bombed. So um, one of the bombs damaged the uh, pumping station at the uh, Craigside Hydro Hotel, um, and then the other two landed on uh, Nantagama, which is a sort of the Badavan end, the Little Horn end of Clandano. Um, and there was no fatalities, there were no injuries even. Um, but, but this happened quite a lot in North Wales, that you would have uh, bombers, uh, German bombers, would uh, try and get rid of their uh, loads if they were intercepted by British fighters, or they just couldn't go back to Goering and say, oh, we didn't drop them. <laughs> so, um, so that, yeah, just, just get rid. And, and certainly in North East Wales, I mean, I mentioned decoy sites, um, there were lots of decoy sites around Minera and, and Minera Mountain and on the moors on top there. And uh, bombs or a fire was started, I believe, at one point, and the Germans dropped more and more bombs on it. And so in the end, there was a massive fireball that could be seen as far as Manchester. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of bombs dropped in North Wales, but not really that many fatalities, unfortunately. But, but there were some. There was, I think somebody killed on Bomaris when uh, bombs dropped. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I don't want to ask a question, I just want to tell you two things. You talked about the bombs going over to Liverpool. My, my husband lived in Bethesda and a bomb, did, uh, an aeroplane did crash. It's uh, just one aeroplane crashed just outside Bethesda and everybody went there to, to have a look and um, my mother-in-law had a piece of the, of the, the window I suppose, it was like a perspex, yes, yellow, yellowish perspex and I had her first when she died, a little elephant that had been cut out of that. And somebody stole my purse and I lost everything. <laughs> but the other thing was, my, I lived in Flint, at the top, up Mount Pleasant, as they called it. And uh, one night, Mum and Dad got us, my sister and I out of bed to stand by the window and we could see Liverpool burning right from the top. Yeah, it lasted for hours. So that must have been May 1941, because that's when the May Blitz yes, um, yeah. hit. And you, that red redness on the horizon could certainly be seen as far as planted there as well, yeah. because locals tell me that you know they too could see yeah. um, Liverpool on fire. And it's quite ironic really, because uh, firefighters from across North Wales, of course, were sent to Liverpool. So one minute they were sort of looking at it from a distance. Thank you, Adrian. I think it's um, okay. over to you, hey. All right, then. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.